Hey everybody, welcome back. Let us finish this topic of training. So uh, where did we leave off? Uh, we left off, we had just talked about steps two and three of the ADDI process for making a training. So that is analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. So we did analyze, design, develop, I think. No, we're still in the design and develop. We had just talked about should it be directed or non-directed, and now we're talking about distance learning. Oh yeah, I can't go back, okay. Now we're talking about distance learning. So distance learning generally means online education, right? So we're talking about e-learning or online learning. So you have to decide when you're doing a training, do you want it to be face-to-face -face or do you want it to be online? And both are fine for whatever kind of training you want to design. When we talk about online, there's more than just the internet. It could be a remote classroom. So in a remote classroom, and I've taught like this before, and it can be interesting. In a remote classroom, you're actually teaching. You're real just like this right now. But this is not a remote classroom. You know, this is more like an anytime classroom because I'm recording a video and you can't ask me questions. In a remote classroom, like when I taught that way once, uh, well, not once, I did it once a semester at Jiao Tong University, and I would teach a class and there was a computer screen near me and there were students who were watching the class, but they were in different places around the world. And if they had a question, they could type the question to me and I could read it and answer the question to the video, even though they're not there. That's a remote classroom. Um, obviously, our Zoom classes are more like a, a virtual classroom, right? Where we're in real time and we're talking in real time. And what we're doing now would be more considered an anytime classroom. You can watch this video anytime you want, but you can't interact with me. Obviously, there are advantages and disadvantages to these things. The advantages, of course, it's, you know, it's very convenient. It's easy for me to update this. I can make a new video at any time. Uh, you can watch this video again and again. You can take breaks. But, of course, there are obvious disadvantages. For one, you need a good computer system in order to be able to do this. Uh, it would be very hard if you only had your phone. You have to be comfortable with a computer. It tends to have a higher dropout rates because it's, it can be hard to just sit and watch a video, as you guys know. Uh, you could also choose to do your training face-to-face, -face, and that can be very useful. Obviously, that's better for things like group work or teamwork or customer service. The drawback or the disadvantage, obviously, less flexibility. You can't just go to class whenever you want. The class is given at a certain time. There's the schedule, the location, the travel expenses. So it can be very effective to do things face to face, but it's also challenging. Now, when you're designing, um, you're developing and designing your training, you also have to think about what is your learning objective? What do you want to achieve in the training? And how do you create a positive environment to achieve that goal? So first thing, how do you decide what you want to achieve? This is called the outcome, and the outcome needs to be decided before you do a training. So the outcome usually should be pretty specific because it should give us a benchmark for deciding was the training successful for the success or the failure. So let's say that you are doing a wine training and you're going to teach people about different kinds of French or Italian wine. And someone says at the company, well, what do you, what should our employees get from this training? And you say, oh, well, they should learn more about wine. I mean, learn more? What do you mean learn more? Like that's so hard to measure. And therefore, how do we know if your training was successful? Maybe people tried a new kind of wine. Did they learn more? I mean, I guess, but they still wouldn't really know what to do with that knowledge. So you can't really say, oh, I'm going to do a training in American culture so they'll learn more about America, learn more about wine. So they'll, you know, have a yoga class and I'll do a training in the, the power of meditation so they can try it. Like these aren't really good objectives. It's not just about learning more or about trying something out. It's really about achieving an outcome. So how do we know what kind of outcome we want to achieve? Well, this goes back to something we already learned, 
which is the competency model. So for a job, we have a competency model. Remember, competency models are for jobs, not for people. And we talked about this when we talked about a job analysis, that this is part of the job description. So the competency model talks about the KSAs, right? The knowledge, skills, abilities, but not really the personality. And we said it looks like this, like a triangle where on the bottom you have the name of the job. And then throughout the triangle, you have the foundation competencies that everybody needs, then the specialized areas of knowledge, the roles that the job fits into. Okay, so level one on top, you have the roles of the job, like you, your role is management or your role is business. This can be very broad. Next is your areas of knowledge, legal knowledge, business knowledge, marketing knowledge. Then your foundation competencies, communication, um, time management, data management, Excel, whatever the competencies you need to have for this job and then the name of the position. So when we talk about roles, some of the things we're talking about are, is it line or staff authority? Are you coordinating between different departments? Are you doing strategy? When we're talking about areas of knowledge, do you need to know the law? Do you need to know strategy? Do you need to know finance? Do you need to know management? Do you need to know HR? These are your big areas. When we talk about foundations, now we're talking about some skills like ethical. And again, this isn't your personality. People don't have an ethical personality, but they might have an ethical behavior, right? Judgment skills, the ability to set goals, uh, the ability to manage tasks, the ability to communicate, the ability to lead, the ability to negotiate, the ability to motivate, the ability to analyze financial statements, the ability, right? These are all abilities. They're not things, I, some people are born with these things. It could be things you're born with. It could be things you learn. So we want to figure out for the job, what when I say I'm going to do a training about wine, what am I trying to develop here? Well, I'm trying to get people to communicate effectively about describing the flavor of a wine. When I give you this wine and you smell it, can you describe it? And the reason we learn this is because it is about communication or is it about um, leadership and being able to choose a wine? Or is it about having good judgment and saying what goes with what? Or is it about motivating your, your customers that you are uh, getting them to believe that you are very knowledgeable or, you know, trying to relate your training to some of these competencies for the job. Once you've done that, you wanna think about the environment that you're creating because your environment is going to very much affect your training success. So are people having fun? Are they feeling excited? Are they motivated? Now in your environment, what are your learning materials? Are you gonna use a PPT? Are you going to bring in signs? Do you have a big piece of paper? Are you using a whiteboard or a blackboard? Are you using a projector? Are you showing videos? Uh, you know, what, uh, what's your, are you using groups? What's your feedback, right? How are you letting people know if they did a good job or a bad job? Are you having the students listen, like one student listens to another and gives them feedback or is uh, the teacher the only person giving feedback? All these are different kinds of ways to change the environment, right? In terms of motivating, right? Here are some examples that was from the Dessler textbook about motivation, right? And they say like at the start of training, uh, give a bird's eye view of the material you're gonna pre uh, present. Bird's eye view meaning just a very quick picture of what you're gonna do, you know, five minutes uh, using examples, using terms and com uh, concepts that are familiar, using visual aids. I mean, not, not super exciting stuff on this chart. But the idea is when we're designing and developing, we're creating this skeleton of what we're gonna do, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, how long it's gonna take. And then we're really developing it. How are we gonna motivate people? What's our feedback? What are we trying to teach? What are our outcomes? How will we deliver it? Is it directed or non-directed? Is it face-to-face -face class or e-learning? Is it remote classroom? Just everything about the training. And then we want to implement and evaluate. So 
how do we we implement it? We just we do it, right? That's there's not much to say about that right now. But let's really jump to this idea of evaluating because that's very, very important. And evaluation asks the question, was your training successful? Did it provide tangible benefits? And how do we measure if your training was successful? How do we say, oh, they learn more about wine? What does that mean? What exactly did the people learn? And was it valuable? Because these days you need a return on investment, what we call ROI. The ROI is critical. If you're teaching people about wine, so what? Why should the company spend money on you? Why should the company give time, their employees time to this training? So you need to know how the outcomes of your training are actually going to change the behavior of the employees. If you teach them about wine, will the employees be more excited? Will they take more customers to dinner? Will they be more open-minded? What's going to change? This is called the training transfer. The training transfer is the idea of can they apply the knowledge that you gave them? If you did a training on culture in you know, wherever you're from, let's say you're from Nigeria and you did a training on Nigerian culture. Okay, they learn the the employees learn something, but are they able to apply that information in a valuable way or was it just an interesting afternoon? So to find out if the employees can apply what they've learned, if there is a training transfer, what we need to do is figure out how we're going to evaluate the training and then apply that evaluation. So generally we need to know the outcomes, what we're trying to teach, and we're gonna ask two questions. Have the trainees learned the outcomes and have they applied the outcomes? These are our two questions. So for one, if I'm teaching them about Nigerian culture or wine or whatever, the first question is, did they learn it? So how do we test that? And then the second question is, did they apply it? And how do we test that? We need to be able to test both of these. So first let's isolate the competencies to see if they learned it. First, we're just talking about, did they learn it? Not did they apply it? So we need to know, first of all, before the training, do we have the right content? I want them to know about Nigerian culture. Do I have the right materials to teach them? I want them to learn about wine. Do I have the right materials? That's before the training. During the training, I need to make sure that the materials are being presented, the PPT works, the videos work, the, the groups are functioning correctly. Are they learning the material? Then immediately after, I need to give some sort of quiz or feedback. I could just ask them questions but I need to find out if they understood what I said immediately after the training, then six months and then one year. Now you could do three months, six months, you could do two months, four months, it, you know, that's up to you, but really to make sure people learn it. And when I say two months, four months, three months, six months, that doesn't mean you have to come back to the company. It might be a, an online quiz that they take. There are many companies these days that offer online quizzes or WeChat quizzes that seek to determine whether a training was effective. There's lots of different quizzes you could make yourself or that you can get from companies. But you need to know if they learn things. So there are two issues. You know, one is how are you going to design this study when you give them a quiz? in three months? How are you going to design that quiz to see if they learned it and if they remembered it? And the second is, do you want to use controlled experimentation? So now we're talking not just about did they learn it, but also was there a training transfer? Did they apply it? So with controlled experimentation, you have a, a control group. So you would have a control group and the control group gets no training. So let's say I go to a company. Now, most of you probably wouldn't do this just because it takes more time and it's not something you would do as a beginner. 
but it's not a bad idea. So let's say I go to a company and I say, I'm going to teach your employees about wine. That's my training. And the company says, well, look, David, that's interesting. But, I, you know, here at our company, we sell we sell um, coffee. OK, it's, we're Starbucks. We don't sell wine. So Starbucks, you know, in China, I, I get it. Wine is interesting. It's but why should our employees take your training? Why should we pay you to do this? And I say, I'm going to do a controlled study for you guys. I'm going to do a training for 20, a group of 20 baristas, 20 of your employees that you choose. And then we're going to take another group of 20 who have the same job, and I'm not going to train them. They are the control group. The control group receives no training. And I'm going to train another group. And by comparing the results of the people I train to the control group, you're going to see that there really is a difference in sales. And when you see that, then you're going to want to hire me to train everybody. But first, I'm willing to do a much less expensive control study where I'm just going to teach five of your employees. Let's say it's a smaller company. It's not Starbucks. It's a small company and they sell clothing. And I say, I'm going to train five of your employees for half the price. And another five employees, I won't train. And we're going to take six months and compare their sales. And you're going to see that the ones that I train were far more effective. So that's a way to convince a company that you, you've, you provide training transfer. That when you teach people things, they can actually apply it towards their sales. So the quizzes that you're giving three months later, six months later, to make sure they're learning this could be every month. You could give them questionnaires. You could give a knowledge review, which is multiple choice or short answer questions, and then you they will write down the answer. You could do observations where you watch them sell or you watch them talk to a customer on the phone and you observe if they're using your techniques. But obviously, you need to find out these two things. You need to find out, have they learned what you taught them about wine, about communication, about foreign countries, and have they applied it, right? So we want this right after the training, six months after, and a year after. And those are, again, just suggested guidelines. So one thing you can do is right after the training, you ask the employees, what do you think you learned? You know, and how do you think you could apply this? Again, we're just talking about learning and applying. These are always the two, right? Number one, did they learn it? Number two, did they apply it? Uh, when we talk about evaluation, that's what we mean. Number one, did the employees learn what you taught? And number two, did they apply what you taught, the training transfer? So, but you can ask the employees. You don't have to just tell them I'm going to teach you about wine and this is what you'll learn and this is how you can apply it. You can ask them, OK, we did a training about wine. Now, I know what I tried to teach you and I know how I think you could apply it. But before we talk about what I think, let's talk about what you think. What do you think you learned today about wine or Nigeria or communication or toilet paper or um, the sun or chemistry or, you know, whatever your training is about? I don't know why I said toilet paper. I don't know what I was thinking of that made me say that. So what did they learn about toilet paper and how can they apply that? Um, maybe it was because of the word ply. I don't know. So this is just feedback, right? You have to make sure they understand this isn't a test. Uh, you're not getting a grade on this. This doesn't determine if you get a check or a gold star, if you were good at the training. This is just feedback so we can talk about it. And it's very, very important to give feedback and to talk to the employees during the training to make sure what they learned. Uh, one thing you can also do, you can also ask them to sign a contract. And the contract says there are three to six things that I learned. And I commit, I promise, I'm going to try to apply these things. 
Sometimes signing something in writing helps people remember it or it helps them to believe that this is important. Another thing to discuss with the employees could be some obstacles. If I say, okay, we learned about wine and describing flavors and, you know, I want you, everybody here is going to sign a contract that says when you go off and you sell clothes, I want you to use the skills you learned today to describe the clothes. It's not just a blue shirt. Describe it the way we learned to describe wines. You know, the shirt is whatever, it's sunset blue, uh, and it reminds someone of, you know, early morning, or let's say uh, sun sunrise blue, and it reminds someone of an early morning when you get up and you're drinking coffee, just, you know, how the same way that we describe wine could be used to describe all kinds of things. And I would ask everybody to sign a contract to commit. And what could be an obstacle? to this commitment that you're going to describe things. Well, you might feel silly, right? Describing a shirt the way you describe a wine. Uh, you might feel embarrassed. Maybe the customers aren't listening to you. Maybe you just can't think of anything, right? You talk about the obstacles and every two to three months, and again, that's just a suggestion. It could be every six weeks, whatever. You renew this contract. You don't make it a, a five-year contract. You make it like a one-week contract or a one-month contract that you request people commit to trying to apply your training. That can be very effective. Another thing we're looking at, and you remember back at the beginning of this class on training, we talked about this idea of identifying a skill gap. What is the gap between what the employee knows and what the employee needs to know? They need to know this, but they only know this. So there's a gap here. So we did this before, right, prior to training. HR did an assessment of each employee's level of KSAO, what they need to be successful on the job, and we recognize that there's a gap for some employees. They have a lower level of skill than the job requires. So we're going to give them this training, and then we re-evaluate the employee after the training, and then maybe after a month or three months or a year, and we see if we are closing the gap so that the employee is now successfully able to do their job, right? So what we really get here is this idea that training is not just about presenting information. We have to make sure we have a clear benchmark, a clear outcome, and that the employees both learned it and can apply it. Ways that we can measure whether or not they apply the knowledge that you gave them. We could do a time series experiment. We could do a controlled experiment, which we talked about. And here are the four things we're trying to measure. So in a time series experiment, like here, it's before training. And over here is, you know, here we did, you know, before training. Then we did the training. And then here is after training. So obviously they did learn. This would be a time series if we're, uh, you know, here's like productivity. So if we have productivity, versus time and we see over time here was our training then they're higher obviously it looks like our training was useful successful this is also very very valuable for trying to sell your training in the future right if you have a chart like this that shows on paper with real quantitative numbers the effect the real applied effect the training transfer of your training you're definitely going to get more customers so what are these four things that we're measuring? Reaction, learning, behavior, and results. First is reaction. And again, you find this out just by asking. You just ask the employees, you give them a questionnaire, you give them a survey, you could do it in paper, you could do it online, doesn't matter, but you need to get their answers. So number one, their reaction. Did they like the training? Even if you're teaching valuable things, if they hated your training, well, then it's not going to work. They're not going to apply it. They're not going to learn things. So did they like it? Did they think it was valuable? Number two, learning. Did they learn what they were supposed to learn? Number three, behavior. Did they apply what they learned? Right? Did their performance change? Did they apply it? So again, learn, apply, learn, apply. And then Number four, what were the final results in terms of your objectives? Were the objectives reached? Were they achieved? 
So we might have an evaluation form that kind of looks something like this, where this is a handout that we give to the training, uh, all the employees, and they can, you know, one, two, three, four, five, did you enjoy it? And what did you learn? And, you know, you can look at this on your own, but this is an example of a form that we would give the employees. Now, one final point that we need to make about measuring the evaluation, about measuring the success of the training. So let's say that I did a training about wine, about how you describe wine. And I want to, I tell the company, you know, they're going to learn how to appreciate wine, how to pair wine with food, but most important, how to use the power of description when they're communicating with customers. Okay, that's a good sales pitch. And I maybe do a control group. I say, I'm gonna teach five of your people and then you're gonna have another five. We're gonna watch both of them, those groups. And then you'll see the five that I train will sell a lot more. Okay, great, good plan. And I'm gonna use this method, distance learning, and we're gonna have a remote classroom and it's gonna be virtual. And you know, I have this whole design and plan and here are my materials. And you know, I then we're gonna meet face to face and I'll actually have everybody taste the wine and whatever whatever your plan is. Now, the company says to me, okay, David, that sounds great. Really, really good. Your training costs, your training costs 10,000 RMB per day. Okay, so you're gonna do two day training for two different groups, and that's 20,000 RMB. I say yes. And they say, how much money is this going to make for us? Well, that's a hard question. How do we specifically measure the value of my training? What's the value in dollars of being able to describe something well? We need that these days, and we call this the ROI. Right now, ROIs are pretty new. Less than 20% of companies are doing this, but it's becoming very popular, and if you know this now, you're ahead of the curve when you're selling your training. So to get the ROI, we have uh, four steps. Yeah, four steps. Step number one, isolate the benefits. Okay, so my benefits of my training are that you'll learn more about descriptions and how to communicate things the way we talk about wine. So how to communicate say, uh, products and the good qualities of products in a very unique and new way. That's one thing they will learn. Another thing they will learn is actually how to take a customer to dinner and order the correct wine. Another thing, so I have these benefits that I say they will learn. And this impacts employee performance because they'll be better at communicating, they'll be more confident, and it will impact the outcomes of the company because you'll get more sales, because you'll get more new customers, right? So I find this out by doing surveys of the employees, focus groups, observations, questionnaires, the same way we learn anything in HR. We just learn by asking people. You know, we learn by asking the company, what is it you want to improve? You want to improve sales or do you want to improve customer retention? Do you want to improve loyalty or satisfaction? What is it you want to improve? So I have to do questionnaires and surveys and observations and interviews to find out what the company wants to improve. Then I present my training as here's a way to improve this. That's step one. Step two, we need to turn this into money. So tangible first, we have quantitative and statistical. So we have to measure, listen, if, you, if I teach you guys about wine and descriptions and communication, you're going to make more sales, right? Your number of sales will go up. Your productivity per employee will increase. Your labor hours will go down. Um, also, the employees will be happier. So your satisfaction will go up and then the customer satisfaction index will go up. You know, maybe the number of complaints will go down. It depends on your training, but we need to be very clear on here are the things that cost you money or help you make money. These are tangible things that will change with the training. And I know that I'm presenting this idea as if you are training 
your trainer when in fact you might be in HR and you're the person who hires the trainer. So you would understand if the trainer says, you know, hey, I would like to present a training about wine and you would say to them, okay, well, what is your ROI? And they would say, well, and you'd say, well, listen, there's tangible and intangible benefits. Tell me some of the tangible benefits of your training because a good trainer knows this. Now, what are the intangible benefits, the benefits you can't measure in money? Satisfaction, commitment, teamwork, communication, right? This can't be measured in money because it's subjective, but it's still very valuable monetarily. Okay, step three, calculate what's called the fully loaded cost. So the fully loaded cost of my training includes the direct cost, which is I am 10,000 RMB per day, but then it's also the indirect cost, right? Direct cost is I am worth, I, I cost 10,000. Also, you have to pay for the wine and the wine costs 3,000. So it's actually 13,000, you know, whatever I need to bring, I need to bring cups, I need to, whatever, you know, that's the cost. But then there's also the cost of having all of your employees come for three hours to be trained by me because those three hours, they're not on the telephone making sales or talking to customers. Um, any equipment that I, that I use, if I'm using a room and you need, you know, because I'm using this room, you can't have a staff meeting right now. All of these are costs. So we have to figure out the cost of everything, my cost and the cost to the company. That's the fully loaded cost. And then we're gonna compare the value of the benefit to the cost, that's it. And so the ROI, will be the benefit that I bring. So remember back in step two, I can't go backwards on this PPT. Um, yeah, I can't go back, but you know, on step two, we talked about actually figuring out, okay, so you guys right now make an average of four sales per day. That's your average. Well, with my training, I predict you guys will make an average of six sales per day because the ability to communicate and describe in this way, like with wines, will make your customers more interested. So two extra sales, that's $1,000 per sale, that's $2,000 per day, right? We just have to predict. And once you've been doing training for a longer time, then you have more evidence, you have more statistics to back up your claims. Obviously at the beginning, you're just making a prediction. But you would still say, listen, here's the benefit I predict times 100 divided by the total cost, the fully loaded costs. So if the benefits were, for example, 120,000 and the total costs are 100,000, you'd have 120,000 times 100 over 100,000. I would say your return on investment if you hire me is 120% return. And that's great. Right, so I'm only adding $20,000 worth of value, but that's a 120% return. That's great, it's an amazing return for your money. So, so we wanna calculate the ROI this way. Okay, that's one kind of training. Now there's a whole other kind of training that's important called career development. Now, one big question, of course, if I work in HR, why would I want to develop your careers? You work in marketing. Okay, great. You work in marketing for my company. What's the problem? Why do I need to, what are you going to quit? Should I help you quit my company? And the, the answer kind of is yes. It's not that I help you quit. I want you to be satisfied. You work in my company. Let's say we work for DuPont. I was reading something about DuPont this morning. DuPont is a very big old chemical company. They have a big, uh, lots of factories in China and you get a job working for HR in DuPont and somebody there is in management, uh, sorry, in marketing, they're in marketing. Now, why would you try to counsel them to give them individual career counseling to help explore what other jobs they could do? Why would you do that? You know, and there's two reasons you would do that. Number one is to keep them at this job now. Maybe they don't like marketing, but maybe they have skills and knowledge for advertising or product development or 
you know, dealing with customers or sales or, you know, we need to find out what other skills and abilities they have because we don't want them to just quit. They're part of the team now, they're part of the family and they know how we do business here. So just because they don't like the job doesn't mean they don't like the company. DuPont is a very big company. There's lots of things they could do. And that idea should begin right when they enter the organization. You know, okay, welcome to our company. Here's, this is your job. But you know, let's meet and discuss your abilities and whether or not there are other things you might like to try also, because we want you to be satisfied here and we don't want you to leave. We want commitment. So we want to tailor this program to the individual. We want follow-up interviews, right? So we want to make sure, okay, look, you, you've had this job now for two months. Let's meet with HR and talk about how's it going? Is it everything you expected it to be? Are you surprised? Let's meet again at six months. Let's talk about how it's going. You know, another thing we can do is rather if let's say someone is not accepted. So you apply for a job at DuPont and we do not accept you. Now we could just write you a letter saying, sorry, you didn't get the job. And lots of companies don't even do that. They just don't call you. But what we could also do is have you come in, say, listen, you wanted this job and it's not gonna work out right now, but we wanted to describe the skills and the training and the education and the things that we think you need to get this job. Because if you really want this job, maybe you can go out and do some skill training and apply then next year if you really want the job, prove to us. Now, this is something that makes the employee, or in this case, the candidate, feel very good because you're actually bringing them in for an interview to talk with them. Remember, somebody who might not be a great employee right now, if they really want to work at your company, they really might make the efforts to become the kind of employee you want in the future. So you always want to keep an up-to-date record of the skills of any candidate that you see. If you get new information, you want to update their file. Right? Don't think about whether the goals are practical or realistic, given the present organization. Your objective is to give some inspiration and aspiration to tell them, here's what you could achieve in the future. You know, you want to make their goals part of the organizational goal. You want to map out a career plan for them. So let's say you come in and I say, okay, so you're starting in marketing. What do you really want? And you say, I want to be a vice president. And I say, okay, obviously you're not ready for that today. You're just starting in marketing, but that's not impossible. Let's keep in touch. Let's meet every two or three months and have a, a short meeting and discuss where your goals are and where you are in that. I mean, that means so much to an employee to show them that you're very serious about this. By doing this and keeping these records of all the employees and what they want, it also helps a lot with succession planning because we don't want to lose productivity if somebody leaves. So we should know who are the key employees who could replace managers or vice presidents or other higher level professionals. We should know that. Now, in addition to this, another thing we can do in HR for training is called an acceleration pool. In this, we would take, let's say that in HR, I've identified 10 people who I think these people are really, really interested in becoming senior managers someday. They don't want to leave this company. They really are interested. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get these high potential candidates together and I'm going to invite them to attend some special programs or conferences or trainings and I'm going to put them in this pool. Now, they might be in this pool for five years. This is very common to choose people. Sometimes it's a minority pool where they choose black applicants, or sometimes it is a gender pool where they choose female applicants, but they create a pool of high possibility or high potential people, and they're going to give them lots of special trainings. There's lots of benefits to being in these kind of pools. And in HR, these can be very, very good motivational tools. Another thing we can do in HR is to try to develop a mentoring program where you choose someone who works in the company, like a vice president or a manager, and you partner them with a high potential candidate 
for some one-on-one -on -one mentoring. This helps with trust and it helps with sharing. Um, it's not practical, of course, because it takes the manager's time. Um, having a one-person mentor, four to six people, is more cost-effective, but if you can do one-to-one, -one, it can be very, very useful for the employee to identify their goals, to get guidance, to figure out what can they realistically expect. So very, very valuable. Uh, generally, if we're choosing people, we're going to choose them based on their potential, their skills, their knowledge. This mentoring program could last six months or a year. Usually it's at least six months. Um, mentors usually meet once every two weeks or four weeks or something like that. Okay, now if you have a mentor or you have uh, a, an acceleration pool or you want to train people in HR, so of course you can always hire a trainer. Now what else could you do besides hiring a trainer? What we've talked about so far is hiring someone to come in and then, okay, we, we know they should have an ADI process and they should be able to have outcomes and benchmarks and we should be able to evaluate and we know all this stuff about hiring or bringing in a trainer but what about training techniques that we could do in hr so one thing we could do is called on the job training but first we need to have our budget so whether we hire somebody or we're going to do it ourselves we need to know is it going to cost us money to develop this obviously we could hire someone an outside person to develop it. We could hire someone to come in and do it or just develop it for us. There are direct costs that we talked about. We pay the trainer. There's indirect costs like using a room, using the employee's time, lowered productivity while they're being trained. Maybe we pay the employees. This happens sometimes. Pay the employees. What if we have a training on a Saturday? Okay, we'll give them overtime pay to come in for the training. You should always if you can pay your employees for training and then is there a cost for the evaluation while we're giving them interviews or questionnaires or surveys or have taking an online test every month are there costs well there's the cost of developing the test maybe we hire someone to make the test maybe we make it ourselves but even if we make it ourselves that's time that we're spending if i spend two days on the test that's two days that I'm not doing something else. So there are costs to making these evaluation tests. Now, once we have some money, we could do this on the job training. So in on the job training, we're gonna try to get mentors, get coaches, have assistant to two positions. So if somebody is a manager, we could get somebody else, a high potential candidate, who's not the assistant manager, they're the assistant to the manager. If you ever saw the TV show, The Office, Dwight was never the assistant manager, he was the assistant to the manager, right? We could have job rotation. In job rotation, if people are interested in trying other jobs, let's say you've been working in the marketing department for you know, two years and you're kind of bored. Well, for the next four weeks, for the next month, we're going to move you into the sales department and every day you're now a salesperson and they're going to show you how to do it. And then after that, for one month, we're going to move you into the, uh, the research department and they're going to show you how to do it. And yeah, we don't care if we lose some productivity, we want to keep you. So we're going to move you, we'll rotate you into different departments to see which one works for you. And in a lot of these departments, we have cascading responsibility where the manager is responsible for the people under them. So we can bring you to a new department and the manager will be responsible for your training. And that's a way for an employee to try a bunch of different jobs. We could also have coaching. So coaching has a four step process where you prepare, you need to understand the employee, you need to understand their skills, you need a hypothesis about what the problem is. Generally in coaching, we're doing this if there is a problem. In modern coaching, you really don't offer advice. Coaching has a lot to do with asking questions and letting the employee an answer for themselves. So if an employee is having trouble making sales, and I might say, okay, so what's the problem? And they say, oh, the problem is I can't make sales. You say, okay, well, what do you think is stopping you? You know, well, I don't know. Well, you know, 
What do you think you're good at? What do you think you're, and it's just questions. I'm never going to tell them, here's the problem, here's the solution. You let them find a possible solution themselves by just asking the right questions. So you plan then uh, what they need to change. You get their agreement about this and you make a change plan. We're going to talk about, oh no, in this class, we don't really talk about organizational change too much, but you create a change plan. You know, how, uh, how long are they going to have to do this plan? What do they need to do on this plan? And then you follow up with them. You make sure that they're following the plan. That's pretty much coaching. You could also have an apprenticeship where uh, you have a high potential employee who becomes an apprentice to someone else. This is usually for skilled workers, but it could be for anything. It could be a classic apprenticeship is usually for creating something. So let's say I make pottery, I make pots, and you want to learn how to do it, you could be my apprentice. It's more often used for those kinds of skills, um, making a chair, you know, making beds, making clothes, uh, making something by, you know, by hand. Usually you have someone watch you and learn from you, and that's an apprenticeship. Popular apprenticeship, things like a carpenter, a chef, an electrician, a dental assistant, um, maybe even a truck driver. All of these things, you're watching somebody do it, and you're learning how to do it. We also have vestibule training, and vestibule training is a simulated situation, right? This is often done in safety training. So in safety training, let's say we are training for a fire. What to do if there's a fire? Well, let's actually have the bells go off and maybe the water come down the sprinklers from the ceiling and everybody, you have five minutes now, get out of the building in a safe way and we'll all meet in front of the building. That's an actual experience. It's a simulation of what would happen if there was a fire. And we'd call that vestibule training. It could be something like an inbox test where you're at a desk and you have emails or inboxes or a meeting or whatever you need to do and we want to see how you do it. It's an actual situation. Another kind of training is behavior modeling. And this is where you model the right behavior. So let's say one of the, uh, let's say we have a group of employees and they're having trouble selling things on the phone. So what we would do is I'd say, okay, everybody come over to my desk and watch me. And I pick up the phone and I make a call to a customer and I do it and the customer's happy. I sell the product. I hang up. I say, okay, everybody, now I want you to go to your desk and I want you all to make one call. So let the trainees practice the way that they just saw. Remember, I'm modeling it the way they just saw. And then I'm going to give feedback. I'm going to walk around and listen to their phone calls and give feedback. Generally, there are four ways to behavior model. There's basic modeling where just like I said, they watch. They watch live or they watch a video example and then they learn to do it. There's a role play where I say, okay, so you're the customer and you are the seller. Please pick up the phone and pretend to talk to the customer and we role play. There's social reinforcement where I just give them a lot of constructive feedback. I say, listen, you know, you guys have great voices. You guys know the product. I really believe in you. Just a lot of praise, a lot of positive encouragement. And then there's transfer of training. And transfer of training is where they're not just trying it. They actually do it. I say, okay, so, you know, I, to I told you how to make a phone call. Go do it now. Now make the phone call. They apply the skills. Um, there's lots of other kinds of training that we won't go into like computer-based training or internet-based training. Um, there's other places to learn, like a virtual classroom or on-demand learning. The last thing to talk about here is training for special purposes. So one special purpose is lifelong learning. Lifelong learning says that for some companies, and this is a very big benefit for employees, we'll say that if you work for our company, we support learning. We don't care what you want to learn about. You want to learn about child psychology, even though you sell clothes, fine. You want to learn about how um, the ships go to the moon, okay. You want to learn physics, okay. You want to learn Russian, okay. 
It's lifelong learning. As long as you work in our company, you have continuing education opportunities. It's like a 401k plan, you know, which is like a, a retirement plan. There's also diversity training, which we haven't talked about. That's training people about, uh, there's also sexual harassment training and things like that. That is not about how to get better at selling a product. It's how to more effectively work in groups. There's teamwork training for the same purpose or empowerment training to feel better about yourself. There's outdoor training or adventure training. These are all kinds of, you know, different types of training. Now, in all of this time so far, we've been talking about how do you train employees? But there's another idea, which is how do you train managers? Managers need totally different skills than employees. So to train a manager, we would want to figure out, first of all, what is the company need? How is the manager performing? And then develop the training. So we can develop it ourselves in HR, or we can hire someone to do it. The traditional way. Traditionally, to train a manager, they would use lectures, they would use case studies, they would use discussion groups, that's traditional. But now, more modern ways are to use 360 degree feedback, to use action learning, to use mentoring, to use job rotation. These are much more modern ways of training a manager. So with job rotation, let's say the manager has trouble communicating. Well, rather than having a discussion group about communication, let's move the manager for two weeks. For the next two weeks, you work sales. You got to learn to communicate. The salespeople are good at doing it. You know, you're still a manager. You haven't lost your job, but we're going to rotate you into another job for two weeks so you can practice. Or we're going to give you 360 degree feedback where everybody from your employees and the people under you to your peers, to your bosses, everybody's going to give you feedback. You know, so there's all kinds of modern ways to do this. We could do it off-site, right? So not at work. So off-site, we might do management games. We might do university programs. We might have corporate universities or give you an executive coach who meets with you off of the job. With action learning, that's something that's popular now. So with action learning, give the manager or a group of managers sort of a job rotation, a full-time temporary position trying to solve a problem in another department. So you'd put them into teams, you'd give them a business problem that is beyond their area of expertise, and then you would have them go and take action, go work, solve this problem. It's not your department, but figure it out, your managers and have them work together that way. With case studies, you would give them a case and it could be a written case or a video case. They need to read it, they need to analyze it, they need to figure out what is the problem. That's diagnose the problem. They need to present their findings. They need to present possible solutions. This is a common method. With a management game, you put people into small you know, companies, not real companies, and they have to compete uh, this you see all the time in like the TV shows, The Apprentice that Donald Trump used to host, where he would take people and put them into small teams and say, okay, guys, today your job is to sell hot dogs, or today your job is to sell a painting or whatever. And they would play this management game. Um, there's lots of other things we could do. Personality tests. Um, yeah, as I said, executive coaches. The final thing we can do is organizational development. So, oh, actually we do touch on organizational change a little bit. So with organizational development, it's an, a form of getting people to communicate with each other. So this has a lot to do with breaking up power dynamics because the hardest part of changing is people have resistance. People don't want to change. They don't want to change how they talk. They don't want to change how they do business. They don't want to change their desk or what they sell or, you know, people are get comfortable and they get into habits. And so we need to overcome that resistance. And that's what the field of organizational change is about. And it uses the idea of power dynamics in OD, in organizational development. 
So there are two theories, and we're not going to really get into this, but you know, one is Lewin. And Lewin, if you took organizational behavior, you've learned this. Lewin said that there's three things you need to change. You need to unfreeze the way things are right now. Right now, the way things are, how you do business, how you dress, where you sit, how you talk, that's frozen. And we need to thaw that. We need to unfreeze it. Then when you're more flexible, we can move your performance to a new level. And then we need to refreeze that and create a new habit, right? So we need to get rid of the status quo. The status quo is just the way things are right now. And we need to get rid of that and change the way things are now to the way things we want them to be. So we want to increase this change, this force for change. So we want to unfreeze first, and that is reduce the resistance. Why don't you want to change the way you talk? You know, well, you've been talking this way your whole life, and you're always very aggressive, and you're mean to people. You know, so, okay, how do we reduce that resistance? And usually, that's by presenting a problem that gets people to recognize the need for change. So I tell you a story about this new employee who came in and we're very excited about her, but she was talking to you and she got very upset and then she quit. And, you know, we're, we're trying to get you to understand what the problem is. Then we're gonna try to develop new behaviors and values and attitudes by talking to you about them. And then we'll try to refreeze to make sure you don't return to your older ways. Um, a, a development of Lewin, and I'm not gonna ask you to know this for the test, but a develop of Lewin was these two guys, Cotter and Cohen, they took those three steps and turned them into eight steps and gave this list of things that managers need to do to help people change. Uh, one other thing is organizational development, and that is action research. So this is similar to changing, but rather than teaching people how to change, you let them learn it themselves. This was some of the foundation of like group therapy, where you have a group of people sit in a circle and talk about their feelings. And that was very much um, organizational development. And these, these days it's become team building, right? Team building is the biggest part. Sometimes there's sensitivity training. Uh, sometimes we give people surveys and that's survey feedback, but team building is really the biggest part of organizational development. Okay, that's it for this subject. I did say that for homework, I'd like you to create your own training event. So here's the slide that talks about that. I want you to explain the five-step ADDIE training process. I want you to explain your needs analysis, task analysis, performance analysis. I would like objectives. You do not need a competency model. I'd like a training budget. I'd like to know what techniques you're going to use. Would it be online or offline? And how would you evaluate it? And that's a lot, but I'd really like you to understand trainings. Okay, and then that is it, and I will see you guys in class.